Hey guys, this is Tom Hanks. Welcome to another stream. Today we will have the third and final race in the 1985 season of the Classic Rally competition. So I'm just about to start uh, Beam and G. Give me a second. Hey, uh, hey, low life Max Camber and Logoris. How are you? How are you guys doing? Gonna switch over to Beam and G. As always, it uh, takes it takes a hot second uh, to switch over in Streamlabs. I'm sorry for that. Okay. So today we will have the race on Pikes Peak Gravel, the short track, and I'm gonna start by warming up, as always. You you're doing great. That's that's awesome to hear. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm fine. Uh, so, uh, like, the Sunday has been, you know, rather uneventful, but it's still it's still good to uh, re recover both uh, physically from the from the workouts throughout the week and also from uh, mentally from the from the stress of the work week that's uh, why I always um, prioritize having the weekend off uh, from both because my normally my daily routine is you know uh, work, work until 6 30 p.m. Monday to Friday and then after that I go to the gym and so the weekend is off from both and uh, tends to work out quite well for me Uh, that was a bit of a stutter there. It's not the last race in the in in this whole competition, but uh, because we will have the uh, the tuning uh, competition as well. That's where the video is gonna go live in about two hours from now. So there will be another three races in this series. But yeah, um, it's it is kind of sad that uh, we're approaching the end of this uh, of this whole series because it's been it's been going on for so long. And you know, rallying, rallying has always been my favorite motorsport. Even though uh, it wasn't really on on TV very often as I was growing growing up, uh, I watched it when it when it was on, and uh, you know that was in the days in the glory days of Sebastian Loeb on his Peugeot, dominating absolutely everything. Although some other drivers like uh, Peter Solberg and um, Uh, who was the other one? Also did well. The the Finn, come on, what, what was his name? Anyway, um, I forgot uh, for for right now. But uh, anyway, it 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 it. it it was cool to watch, but uh, as soon as I like when when my father first told me about uh, uh, you know Walter Röhrl and uh, his days in rallying and Stig Blomqvist and uh, Michel Mouton and uh, the other racers back then, and I first saw that I was like, dude, is this a movie or did this actually happen? Did they really blast up? Uh, uh, on on dirt and, and and snow and ice stages on you know 500 plus horsepower effectively supercars yeah they did
And ever since, since then I've been fascinated with... Uh, oh, yeah. That can happen at any time in these cars, by the way. Ever since then I've been fascinated with... Uh, with, with those kind of race cars from back then and uh, it's pretty safe to assume that uh, those days are never coming back you will never see that again even if eventually cars get back to that sort of horsepower level the power to weight will be uh, will you know was also just insane back then and uh, I don't think we're seeing that again anytime uh, Anytime soon, really, but uh, maybe even anytime in the future at all. And uh, more, more importantly, also the electronics. That uh, the lack of electronics that they had back then, that's certainly not coming back. Ah, uh, why didn't I downshift to second gear earlier? <laughs> that could have been a beautiful slide there, but uh, I messed it up. And also, like, when I was... This also marks... Definitely, um... One of my, uh... Like, this is also definitely my favorite uh, series that I've done on YouTube uh, so far, and... Uh, my favorite uh, automation BMG experience. Because looking back, you know, I think I've told the story a, a few times, but uh, still, um, I bought automation in like October of 2012. Yes, 2012. And um, back then, obviously, it was a sort of standalone launcher and stuff like that. And the only thing that was in the game at the time was the engine designer with inline four and naturally aspirated engines. That was it. It didn't have V8 engines, inline sixes, V12s, no turbos, let alone a, a functioning car designer. Never would I have thought back then that one day I would be driving a, a Group B car in Beam and G that would also look like one of Ken Block's Jim Connor cars, and I and I built it myself. Like uh, we were. We were about as far away from something like this happening as you can possibly imagine. But here we are now. Two forty nine point two. That's a pretty quick time up here. 
I think something else is... Uh, I think one of the competitors is gonna be faster. Though I can't tell you which, which one it will be, but I definitely think this car will be beaten. But 2.49 up here is a pretty damn quick time. <laughs> it does take some serious horsepower to, to get this uh, sort of time. You first heard of automation when they announced you could export uh, your car to Beam and G. Uh, uh, break blind I brought automation. Because now that's with the Steam Workshop, there's so much uh, you can do. Yeah, um, so a little bit of a background story maybe from when, uh, from the early days of automation. So when we only had four cylinder engines in the game, even then, the um, then a forum moderator, which I think he still is, um, their buyer, uh, he he already kind of had some um, calculations and spreadsheets in place that uh, uh, so that we could still do sort of online community challenges where uh, he would basically simulate, you know, a sort of uh, the drag and the weight of a of an engine-less car, if you will, and uh, he would then have calculations for uh, how quickly the, the the car with our engine that we built would go up a hill climb and stuff like that. So there were things like that already in place back then, which I can't even begin to imagine how much work that must have taken. Like basically figuring out the algorithms uh, is in such a way that we as a user only had to make an engine and then fill in the numbers in a, in a Google uh, spreadsheet and then it would tell you, uh, you know, 0 to 60 times and everything like that. I, that that's just... That's just crazy. Eventually we got V8 en engines and then N6 engines shortly after then came V6s and V12s, and I think then we had, and I think then we got turbo engines. Uh, after that came like uh, V10s, then in like freeze, and then. Uh, but I think when we had uh, V12, uh, I think when we had in then sixes and then turbos. So before the V12. That's when the first uh, car designer was implemented. So you can, you, and at the start, I can remember there was like three, three uh, bodies to choose from. You had one uh, sort of coupe uh, 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 type, which is coincidentally, I think this exact uh, body that uh, AZLK here is using. Though I think it was the 2.5 meter wheelbase version instead of the 2.8 that this has, but uh, still this sort of uh, Nissan Silvia-esque uh, looking uh, coupe body. Then there was one hatchback, and I think, and I think there was a sedan, and that was it. It would already give you like uh, drivability and spoiliness and fuel economy and 0 to 60 and stuff like that uh, back in the day as the ATLK does at 253. Hey Opal Safira. And um, I, I remember that there was a time at which you could actually change with a slider how much sound insulation the car should have from a zero to 100 and i kind of want that back now um it's been gone for you know three years at this point or so well maybe actually yeah maybe three years um no more 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 it was before the was it before this was it before this uh, steam update yeah, then it must have been like five years ago. And there was also like a slider that... Uh, 
that would uh, basically on on a reasonable scale um, allow you to scale the overall uh, car's weight to simulate you know panel thickness sound insulation stuff like that there was that in place at some point <laughs> no problem man Hey Finsport, how are you doing? But yeah, automation has gone through quite a few changes since, since I first got it. I was one of the early adopters, I, I suppose. Oh shit, wrong line there. <laughs> we had quite a we had quite a lot of um, forum challenges going on even before this uh, before automation made it onto Steam as well. So uh, you would basically just submit via forum. So PM the the, the creator of the forum thread, and then. And then, because it was obviously not possible to to uh, run the uh, run the cars in BMG yet, uh, there was a pretty active community for for uh, track mods. So people would recreate the uh, like real life tracks for uh, and make them usable files for automation. And then with automation's own uh, track uh, time simulator, the that's how the competitions were held back then. And that and that way, obviously, you also take driver skill out out of the equation because the obviously the AI would perform exactly the same each time. Whereas in a competition like this one, you got, you've got me behind the wheel, so... Two forty nine point six. So the BAC takes the lead for now, but this is only the uh, uh, the the second car uh, in our lineup here. So since BMNG sorts these uh, in alphabetical order, I'm going through these submissions in alphabetical order as well. So next up is going to be the Falcon Challenge Coupe um, with its nine hundred and six horsepower twin turbo V eight. So um.
this feels much more at home here than it did at Jungle Rock Island. But what's up with these brakes? Normally, if you choose the if you choose the rear engine layout with this Porsche body, it, the, it brakes really, really well. But this car, for some reason, doesn't. So I really gotta be careful with the braking point on this first uh, hairpin. Brake super early, like here. Uh, yeah, and then it gets unstable. If I kind of space out the braking and downshifting like I did there, then apparently that works better. So I gotta kind of do my own ABS. I gotta say, this feels much, much more at home here than than it did in Jungle Rock Island. The suspension and uh, like the all-wheel drive layout uh, seems uh, seems much be better suited for Pikes Peak. Of course, you can benefit from the enormous power a lot more because you have all these straights between the uh, hairpins. And of course, uh, it's uphill, so uh, if your engine's not powerful enough here, you're gonna suffer. Oh no! No! Oh yeah, it still counts. Okay, good. We're good. <laughs> still made it. <laughs> now, in the real world, this wouldn't have counted. <laughs> because I basically drove past uh, the, the um, kind of the, 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 the finish line really <laughs> but a 251.2 is a respectable time next up is going to be the hos vilna gt group b now i have to say for most cars even sports cars and you know supercars on on uh, if we're talking about uh, the the paved version of uh, of pikes peak on this track a sub three minute time is a fast time so uh, this doing a 251 and uh, other cars doing you know 249 and stuff like that it's that's fast even by t the modern standards
is the breaking point there. Uh, I'm gonna lock the rear diff too. So yeah, all three diffs locked. It's kinda... It's kinda curious how... Uh, Depending on the track, this setup actually gives you the options to to choose which diff, uh, which diffs you want to lock, and uh, kind of uh, different tracks have different requirements in that in that sense. So it's, for example, on the uh, on the on the automation track, I remember only locking the rear diff. Then on Chang Rock Island, I locked the uh, front and center, and here on Pikes Peak, I found that uh, locking all three is probably the best choice. I should uh, improve my braking there again. Try and not lock up the brakes. turn oh I almost thought I had it there That's what that's what happens when you drive like on on the ragged edge, right? So, if, for the fastest possible time, you gotta use like every inch of uh, of the road as you're entering the corner, uh, as you're exiting the corner, to take as much speed as possible out of the corner. But if you take it too far, then that's what what happens there we go kind of died there in second gear Again.
Blocking all three divs is still a pretty risky decision, though. But I prefer oversteer to understeer, so... Uh, Fifty three point seven. Now compared to most cars that I've ever built, this is one hell of a quick time. Unfortunately, in this group, it is uh, it is the the slowest of these four cars so far. But we have four more cars to, to go. Okay, so the engine stalled, but here the brakes felt much better than on the Falcon, which uses the same body and uh, also rear engine layout. Maybe one has ABS and the other doesn't. I think the Falcon may have ABS and that's what's slowing it down on the on the breaking points here, whereas this doesn't have ABS. This feels, this feels much closer uh, in braking performance to my own car, which doesn't have ABS. So I'm assuming that, that with all other things being equal and uh, the other car's braking performance uh, being worse, that may be like a fault on uh, Beam and G's end with uh, the ABS implementation. Never realized this actually boosts up to three bars. I don't know if any real world group B car actually ever made three bars of boost. Although, actually, maybe the Lancia Delta may have. Because remember, there was like a 1.7 or so liter engine twin charged, making over 600 horsepower. So. Yeah, here the LLMC is definitely one of the top performers. Oh, come on. Made it 248.3. Damn. Well done. Jesus. That's fast.
Wow. <laughs> um, that's very impressive. I think that's going to be hard to beat. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. Yeah, neither was I. I mean, during the run, I already, I already felt like your car is, 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 is doing pretty well, but... Beating the BAC here? Well done. <laughs> um, next up road, uh, Miranda, and this is going to fly up the straights. I don't, I'm not sure about how it's going to handle through those corners, though. But as you can see there, uh, uh, from the fact that it was touching nearly 180 before this, the first uh, left-hander. Once this sees any sort of straight stretch of road... Okay, so yeah, uh, I did also see the ABS uh, flashing up there, so it is in fact the ABS, and this has the similar. This has a similar problem to what the Falcon had. So I suppose going without ABS would have been the better choice, which is a little bit odd. wheeling when cutting that corner. <laughs> now we put the hammer down. Oh, and the engine was actually briefly overheating there. It's really interesting how uh, ABS is actually hurting these cars' performance. You'd think that ABS would be a tremendous advantage. Especially on gravel like this. And I suspect, I suspect it's probably just a, a, a bug within BMG that is just not functioning properly here, but... Uh, But the impact that this is having on the, on this cars and also the Falcon's performance is uh, undeniable. Crossing the line at like 2.20. 2.48.4. Close, but second place behind the LLMC. Like... To be honest with you, going into this race, I thought this would win. And it's really close, but I thought this would be by far the quickest here. Because I knew just how... Uh, just how fast this... This is on a straight, and obviously Pike's Peak has a lot of straights between those tight corners. 
It's still in second though. Uh, but now we're we're gonna have the slam MG two thousand Group B, and um, I don't think this will change anything about the first one or two spots. But uh, it could st uh, still uh, it could still make an improvement over the last two races where it came last. Uh, I'm also gonna unlock all of the devs here. Yeah, like after driving the Miranda, this this feels like an ordinary car when it comes to uh, its acceleration and everything. And that's saying something flying up here at over a hundred miles an hour there, but uh, But really, this is this is re like the lack of oomph in this one is uh, very obvious. It's not like I think I've said this before, but um, the peak number of this is 450 horsepower. But the problem is that the the torque is also. Um, only really starting to climb at you know 6000 so it's basically the torque and the horsepower are on a consistent climb with with this engine which is not what you want you want a more flat torque curve on a naturally aspirated engine so that you know when you when you are for example in second gear right here you want to accelerate which uh, okay there it goes um, and considering that we are already at 2 minutes 20 and the Miranda was basically at the last checkpoint already right now and we're not even past this uh, sort of half blind left hander shows how uh, how massive the difference is in performance between these two cars. Again, compared to most cars, this is pretty quick, but uh, unfortunately in a, in a Group B lineup, this, is, uh, this needs to go back to the drawing board, and especially um, I think the engine could be a lot better if it, it revved higher, even with everything else left the same. You see, 3 minutes 10, that would have been a very competitive time uh, in like the 1982 season, I think. But along these cars, it's it's um, far and away the slowest. I'm, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to put it that way, but... We do still have the Snow Leopard, which I think is going to do much better uh, than the Slame just did. But can it get? Can it truly compete with with the top dogs here? Still launches as hard as ever. Already going faster here than the slam was by the end of this stretch. Mm -hmm. 
Hey Genja, how is it how's it going? Ah, come on. Weight reduction, yeah. Thirty point nine for a split. That's fast. And remember, this makes half as much power as the Miranda, and yet it was competitive up until the first checkpoint. Nearly at the finish line and in the snow leopard and it's gonna be a two fifty point nine. You are a much better driver driver than I am. Thank you. Uh so yeah. Okay, so I am gonna I am gonna finish up uh, wrap up this race here. Um since this was the last car lined up. The victory this time goes to the LLMC upsheet. Uh, so first place eight points. Second place goes to the Miranda Sahara. Uh, third place goes to the BAC Raider. But before you guys leave, um, Stick, stick around, uh, there's going to be something else coming up. Uh, so 250.9 puts the Snow Leopard into fourth place. Wow, it actually came fourth in all three races. This is the only uh, car that took the same position each time. Then fifth place this time for the Falcon. Uh, sixth place for the ACLK. 
uh, then seventh place for the HOS and then eighth and last place oh I, I suppose he also came in the same position each time so um, let's calculate the scores the Miranda Sahara third place in the first uh, third place in the first race then sixth place in the second race and then the second place in the last race gives us a total of 16 points then the HOS uh, is going to come in with a total of 11 points then the ACLK is gonna uh, get a total of 13 points the Falcon is going to also score 13 overall then the BAC Raider is gonna get uh, 22 points then the Slam gets 3 the LLMC is going to have uh, seven and then eight is fif 15 points overall and then the snow leopard is also going to score 15 points overall so overall standings are going to be first place uh, is going to be the BAC Raider second place is going to be the Miranda Sahara and then third place is going to be tied between the LLMC Upsheet and the snow leopard v2 uh, right However, we are gonna gonna have a little a little something out of com uh, outside of competition coming up here, and that is I'm going to test all of these cars um, on the quarter mile because we can't we can't have like these crazy powerful uh, you know Group B cars with massive horsepower and great traction and then not see how quick they are. I think that would be, um, I think that would be, um, you know, giving uh, giving them a sort of disservice. But um, we're gonna start. I'm gonna start with my own car, actually. Ah, oh, shit! I should have done this sooner should have done this before but anyway you're using off-road tires it's gonna be terrible uh, I, I don't think it's gonna matter that much because here on the drag strip the tarmac is very sticky so I don't think you're gonna be struggling for traction Ten point seven. Uh okay, ten point seven, sure. That was pretty quick. So let's see what, what the ACLK with 730 horsepower can do. Like my own car, it bogged down uh, because of too much grip at the start. 11.5. But yeah, 10.7 on a quarter mile is a ridiculously quick time. This is just wheelied. Oh my god, this is quick. This is a 10.5. Wow. Damn. <laughs> Yeah, this is. Uh, I, I was gonna say that anyway. With your car, I'm, I'm gonna launch it first right here because you, you 
you're doing a second gear launch normally for more traction, but here it's much stickier, so uh, you, uh, you you would just bog down, and uh, therefore I'm gonna launch in first. I was gonna do that anyway. For some reason, the pavement here is much more grippy. Dude, it's, it's a drag strip. You ever been to a real drag strip? This actually maxes out in fifth gear here on the quarter mile. 10.8. I was expecting this to be quicker, to be honest. With 900 horsepower. Okay. Never been to a drag strip. I've only been uh, to to a drag strip once, and only uh, you know as a as as a spectator. This, unfortunately, I see as one of the events where I don't think the HOS is gonna do as well. But I am going to lock the center diff. Actually, it's still a pretty quick car, 11.5. Like, you gotta consider this is still a very, very fast car. <laughs> by, by almost every metric, so... Next up, the LLMC upsheet. But uh, compared to this, uh, n compared to the rest of this lineup, you know, we've, we've got cars in the field which make twice as much horsepower. That's why I thought it, it, it wasn't gonna do as well but still very good eleven point one for the LLMC still a very fast time but not at the top the uh, BAC is still on top here, but I think that's gonna change in a second when the Miranda goes. <laughs> I definitely expect the Miranda to be the quickest here. Like if if you saw the way it just flies up those straights on Pike's Peak, there is no way that this won't win here, in my opinion. Unless I uh, mess up the start. Actually, it bogs down even if I get the start as right as I possibly can. 10.6, and it's actually slower than the BAC. I think the gearing is just too long for it, for uh, for for this track here. It makes the car grip up more on normal pavement, which is great, but here it's just a bit too long, and therefore it uh, it kind of bogs down at the start. Then it wheelies, uh, but then it's already too late. The BAC, the BAC is already gone by that point. Thirteen point oh. That's unfortunately not as impressive as some of the other cars here. But now I'm really curious about the Snow Leopard. Ten 
10.9 and you know what i'm gonna try again launching a second gear okay bad idea i'm just gonna cruise to the finish line now because uh, i want to see the overall standings that was still an 11.4 didn't even get into fifth gear yeah yeah but yeah 10.9 makes this the um fourth quickest car on the quarter mile almost on par with the falcon uh which has 500 more horsepower yes 500 more that tells you everything you need to know about uh uh, engine tuning <laughs> in these two cars yeah you do in fact have the lowest amount of horsepower in this entire field but let me tell you it doesn't feel like it anyway um the the rules video for the next challenge is going to be uh, public in a pretty much exactly one hour from now uh, so that'll be the tuning challenge and i hope you guys enjoyed this season and this particular stream and um yeah we will continue with the next challenge starting well pretty much very soon and Hope you enjoyed and uh, i will uh, i hope to see you guys in the next challenge as well and until then have a good one and see you next time goodbye